Hello, hello, you guys. This is uh, Sage the Coach from Outside the Box. And um, tonight we have a very, very special guest. We're um, going to be talking to Andrea Braxton about finding God through your grief. Uh, my show, Outside the Box, usually comes on on Monday nights at 8 p.m. But when I do interviews, I do them at 7. I know that's kind of confusing, um, but that's how I do it for now. And so um, right now I'm going to just... If you guys can give me a few moments, I just want to make sure everything is streaming right on social media. Um, Andrea, you can make sure you're sharing the stream wherever you want to share it at, and then we will get going with the interview. So just one second. Okie dokie. So copy I wish there was an easier way to do this, but right now this is the best I have. Hopefully, eventually I figure something else out. <laughs> um, one second. And then it seems like whenever I'm trying to do this during the show, I can't find stuff, which is really annoying, but anyway. What did you say? I said that is fine. I'm trying to figure out how to share. I'm not good with this stuff. I'm just yeah. <laughs> I can do it all the best way I can. I uh, know it's like any other time it's fine. I can share with no problem. But whenever I'm doing this and I'm trying to share, all of a sudden I can't find stuff. It's like, oh my goodness. Okay, now I shared it there, and I got to share one more place, and that's it. Okay, here we go. Okay, I got it shared everywhere. Okay, so um, thanks you guys for tuning in. Uh, make sure you like and share my page, um, this video. We're going to be having a very um, serious discussion tonight that I think will be very, very helpful for a lot of people. And so make sure you like and share this. Again, we will be talking about finding God through your grief with Andrea Braxton. I don't know if you guys, you know, following this, the speakeasy, and um, you know some of the interviews that we've done in the past, but this is not Andrea's first time uh, with us. She's done interviews before, um, and they all revolve around the unfortunate passing of her daughter, um, who was hit by a school bus, and the driver was never uh, prosecuted. And so it's, it's been a while since this happened, and since then, Andrea has been very, very active in trying to um, get justice for her daughter and bring... Um, awareness of the fact of that the driver was not charged was not even arrested um and so that is one part of this the probably the biggest part of this whole thing but another part of this is andrea as a mother you know a mother who has lost a child um i don't um have i can't even begin to understand how she feels but one thing that always struck me with the interviews that we did with her was the things that she learned about herself and learned about God and even got delivered from during the process of dealing with her grief with her daughter. Um, and so Andrea, if you want to take, you know, just a few minutes to, um, you know, maybe if you want to ex explain a little bit more of the situation that happened with your daughter, just to give a little bit more information on that. And then we can dive into, you know, the questions about your, your, your process of grieving and your spiritual growth and things like that throughout the process. Okay, so yes. Um, so on October the 4th um, of 2016, um, Amaya and her brother um, was getting off of the school bus and a passenger in a car who was following the school bus um, ignored the stop sign. Um, Amaya had just got ready to step off and she swept her with her car and had her pinned under her car and she got away scot-free and she killed my baby um, in my driveway in front of her house. Um, I might have never even had to cross the street, so she got killed in her yard being a child. Um, and the driver of this crime got away scot free. Wow, 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 that's such a heavy thing! Oh, my goodness! So, um, 
And so I know you talked about like, okay, so Andrea has a book that um, she has out called God Works on Tuesdays too, where she kind of explains some of the things that she went through during, during this time of like finding out that her daughter was hit, finding out that her daughter passed away, um, a lot of the um, confusion or, you know, around the prosecution and the things that they were kind of playing games with her and things like that. But you talk in your book about um, on God, God works on Tuesdays too. how you felt about your life before this happened. So can you talk a little bit about where your frame of mind was before this happened and um, how what was your relationship with God like before this happened? So I have always seen to, I have always had um, a relationship with God, even as a small child, even though my parents didn't take me to church, I had cousins who were faithful members. So I, I started to go to church with them and um, I joined the church. Um, it was Good Shepherd Church of God in Christ um, under Robert L. Fleming and his first lady, Shirley Fleming. They were, they actually brought us up and they brought us up right. And so a lot of the stuff stay with me. Um, a lot of things that I do now concerning my life, it stays with me. So I've always knew God had a purpose for me. I just didn't know what the purpose was. Okay. I was always the one that all I had was God to lean on. Um, because I was always looked down upon. Um, before this happened, um, I was going from relationship to, um, excuse me, a relationship to relationship. Um, mm -hmm. I met my first husband when I was 15 years old. Um, I was pregnant by the time I was 16 and married too. Everything in my life has happened so fast. Mm -hmm. And I didn't wait, you know, to try to get myself together and to concentrate on school. I went right to another relationship, trying to find somebody to fill the void. And in the back of my mind, and um, I knew God was there, but I wanted to know if you're here, then why do I feel the way I do? Why am I being rejected so much? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I love so hard. I jump in there and I love so hard. Mm -hmm. and, and I got nothing. I didn't receive any of the love back. You know, being a young mother and a young wife, trying to figure all this stuff out. And then I went from relationship to relationship and I never even got a chance to know who I was. So I took all this stuff with me to each relationship. And mm -hmm. so it was a lot of backlash there. It was a lot of confusion there. Um, and then I had some childhood trauma to add mm -hmm. to that. So mm -hmm. my whole life, I've been trying to figure out, God, where are you? I know you're here somewhere. Right, right. I really need you to come on right now because I'm about to make another stupid mistake because I need some guidance, you know, like mm -hmm. I know you're here again. I know you're watching <laughs> and I probably know I shouldn't be doing this, you know, mm -hmm. but I just need you to help me because I'm so lonely and mm -hmm. I just want to be loved. I just want to be popular. I just want to be normal. And I've always not been normal. But I've always been the one that was not normal. As people could tell you that know me, they like, she got a good sense of humor. She'll make you laugh. Um, real bold. I've always been bold. I've never been really afraid to do anything. Um, but it's just, I was lonely and I was broken before this happened with Amaya. And for years, you know, being told I was never going to be anything. I was never going to evolve. I was just going to be this person that nobody wanted that started to become a part of me. So after I got rejected, um, the last time I, I waited a little while, but I wasn't ready yet, but I jumped into something else. Mm -hmm. So my whole life I've been jumping and running. So that is what my life was like before Amaya died. Okay, wow. So how do you, um, so how did it change after she died? Because I know, you know, some of the things that you talk about in your book, which is why I wanted to interview you today, are so profound. Even the conversations that we've had um, before, beforehand, they are just really, really so profound. And I kind of want to you know, dive into that as much as I can. I know you always say you're an open book. So <laughs> how did, how did, okay. So you have this feeling, you know, that God's there, you have some awareness that he loves you, but you're feeling kind of lost and empty. So it would seem like to a normal person that the death of your daughter would make that worse, but your book, you almost make it sound as if it, it, it made it it made it better in a way i don't know i don't know if better is the right word but it just seems to kind of open some things up there that maybe you didn't know about can you explain how it changed after she passed 
So going up into the um, going up until the weeks prior to that, um, I have been in church off and on my whole life, um, and so I was faithful up at the Good Shepherd Church for 19 years straight, um, and then I went to another church because I was dating somebody else, and so I've been in church, you know, my whole life. I can pretty much say that, mm -hmm. and so one thing I've always did was I was the one that was not afraid. Um, I remember when I first directed a choir, I was about 10 or 11 years old. The first lady said, who want to direct this choir? Because I'm tired of doing it. And I just put my little hand up like I knew that I can do this. Had no experience, no nothing. And I said, I'll do it. Mm -hmm. So I have always been the one that says, I'll do it. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I have never held back on God to say um, I have never been the one to worship, but not want to participate in anything. Mm -hmm. um, I've always tried to be a part of something. So even as I did it in the world, trying to fit in, mm -hmm. I brought that mentality over to the church. Like, I want to do this. Like, who wants to be in the kitchen? Nobody really likes to serve in the kitchen. But you will see me running up, volunteering to help. Because mm -hmm. I've always had, I've always felt like I've always had to give God something mm -hmm. when I came to church, when I came into his presence. I've always had to give him something regardless mm -hmm. of what my lifestyle was like regardless of the pain regardless of the depression when I went into his house I literally tried to leave all that at the door mm -hmm. leave it at the altar even though sometimes I had to go back and I had to face it and yeah. I was hurt at least when I was in that little spot for them two or three hours it was some amazing feelings and so all that just it just came circling it, it, well, it just came to surface on October mm. 4th. It mm. just all came. I mean, I remember um, I remember there was times to where I don't have the best voice. I will try to sing a little bit. I'm a bad <laughs> I can make everybody else sound good, okay? I really don't have well, you know, I really don't have all that. Um, mm. But I will try, you know, and, and, and I will do it for God. I mean, I absolutely would. Mm. So, you know, and I just remember all them times that I sent all them praises up and I think about all that time that I studied and I thought about all that time that I'm singing. And I'm thinking about all this time that I prayed. Mm -hmm. This stuff really does pay off, but it does not mm -hmm. really happen overnight. Mm -hmm. But you got to do some kind of seed planting. So I told myself when this happened, I said, God, I have sent all these praises up mm -hmm. to you. I've sent everything up to you. It's you got to really help me. Mm -hmm. And so I remember um, the next day um, after I made it back home, people started bringing things to my house. Mm -hmm. um, people I've never met before. Um, and they referenced to Amaya as a person who when they love to see her get off the school bus. Mm -hmm. They said she was always happy. Mm -hmm. Because that was their routine. So that's when they went to work. That's when they got off. So they got to see her. Mm -hmm. And I remember telling this one lady in a truck because she was crying and I was smiling. And she said, you are so strong. She said, how are you smiling? She said, girl, this is about to tear me up. And I said, well, I'm going to tell you what, sister. I said, I tell you this. I said, I love God yesterday. I said, but I really want you to know that I show sure enough love him today. Mm. I said, just something about me. I love God more than I ever have in my whole life. Mm. And so I just started speaking that. And I just kept saying that. And I just kept saying, God, I love you so much. Thank wow. you so much. You know, and that's just something I had to tell myself that because mm. there was a part of me that wanted to lose my mind. There was a part of me that I felt like I even felt guilty for not breaking down and crying like other people oh, wow. I myself like I can't even break down like I'm supposed to be the one because I'm thinking it doesn't look right that I'm not breaking mm -hmm. down um, it doesn't look right to people but I just kept on saying Lord I love you I love yeah. you like I love you God I even told as we was doing the service I even asked um, the pastor at the time, which he's still my bishop. I'm I'm not in Mississippi anymore, but Bishop Everson, right. first nun. If y'all check, if y'all in Mississippi near New Orleans, y'all check it out. Mm -hmm. Very great people, very good people. Um, I told him, I said, would you call an altar call, like mm -hmm. at the funeral, 
Like this can't oh. be for nothing. Like mm. people do they need prayer? I mean, I went into the funeral with thinking, how can we help God's kingdom? Because my I had lost my baby and I had wow. been telling God that I loved him so much. Now I got to show him how much I love him. Mm. I remember at the funeral, actually, it was about five, six, seven hundred people there. And I remember I was standing up and I was worshiping God when they were singing, because at this point I had told him that I needed his help. Mm -hmm. and I didn't even know that he was really helping me. I really didn't even know that he was just gliding me right through it. I mean, there was some rough spots mm -hmm. at the funeral. Don't get me wrong, especially when we had to go to the grave site. And I knew that was going to be the last time that mm -hmm. was the hardest time. But mm -hmm. for the most part, when I tell you that his hands was on me, I could literally feel him giving me life. And even though this stuff was going on, I was still testifying and speaking to people and letting people know I can't be angry with God because she has a resting place. I said, now I got to get the rest of us here. And so, you know, I had to I had to let God do what he wanted to do, his perfect work in me. I literally had to let him do it. And it started from that day. Wow. I can't even explain how two weeks you ready to take pills, you ready to end it. And two weeks later, when just like you said, your daughter dead in your driveway and you talking about, thank you, God, I'm healed. You know, you just yeah. have to. You just have to send those praises up. I mean, mm -hmm. he literally tells us in the scripture, mm -hmm. if you send them up, I'll send you some stuff down. Mm -hmm. But people, a common person would have been so angry. Mm -hmm. God would have been the last thing on their mind. That's the first person that I ran to. Wow. That's the I even, even the next night, because that first night I couldn't sleep because I was thinking, you know, she going to come back and, you know, she going to see me. So I just stayed up and I was so exhausted the first two days. But then I was like, wait a minute, hold up. I got to get some sleep. <laughs> I got to get some sleep. So I prayed, but then I opened up the word and I read the scripture on what the scripture says, what happens to the dead. So I actually found scriptures. And I actually started studying those scriptures and I was able to start back sleeping. Mm. And I'm gotcha. talking about good sleep. This is amazing. So, <laughs> wow. So it's, it sounds like you were in so much pain and you had so much grief. You didn't know what else to do, but praise God. And that's what you did. Mm -hmm. And you just kept, I mean, that's, it sounds like that's what was just, keep um, helping you get through. You just was praising and pray. Wow. 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 So, I mean, I know that a lot of people, and, and this is what people on the outside would even say, and I would say even people on the inside would say it, but most people would think that you would be upset with God or even hurt. Like, why didn't he tell you this was going to happen? You know, why did he let this happen? So did you have any of those type of thoughts or feelings, even if it was just a moment that you were just like, well, why did this happen, or or why why couldn't you be upset with about uh, uh, upset with God, upset with God? Sorry about it happening because, like you're saying, that's going to be like the normal normal reaction. Now I know what you're saying about you know you were just praising God and praising God and things like that, but for people, especially other people who have lost their children, how did you? you know, not be angry with God and, and not question why he allowed this to happen. Um, one reason why I didn't question is because I was able to maintain a relationship with him um, even as I was a child. So I've been, I've been knowing God a long, 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 long time. Okay. And so I have an advantage over some people and, okay. and I don't want to make myself seem like I'm way up here, but I was just put in a position to where I had an advantage mm -hmm. because I truly knew mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. at some point in your life, you got to know that it's out of your control. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. there's some point in your life where you have to realize that he is the most important help you will ever have. And he mm -hmm. is always there at some point. And so I just had an upper hand because I knew who he was. Okay. And again, 
I've been singing, I've been lifting up, I've been serving for a very long time. And mm -hmm. so this was helping me. Mm -hmm. Everybody's not so fortunate. So I want to just encourage everybody to get to know who God is, get to know mm -hmm. who Jesus is, really begin to search the scriptures and find out because it's really, truly power in those scriptures. I'm telling you, it just, mm -hmm. even when I get weak sometimes now and I get upset now, and when I have this thing about me now, I even have to go back to that. I have to go yeah. back to where I was thinking him and I was thanking him for when all this happened. I even have to take myself back there. Mm -hmm. and I have to keep myself focused because things are not going my way. I'm still fighting a battle for justice right now that I shouldn't even have to fight. Exactly. You know what I'm saying they just deny me justice just because they want to. Exactly. But I still have to do things according to the way God wants me to do it. And wow. then, you know, Romans 8 and 28, it says everything works together for my good. And mm -hmm. that's something that I tell myself too. Everything works together for my good. So everybody is not on that spiritual level. Um, so you just have to take one day at a time. You just have to, you just have to learn how to start moving with one less person. Because wow. I used to say a bunch of, I used to say three tables, three plates at my table. I don't get to set them anymore. Mm -hmm. You get what I'm saying? So for my smaller kids, I only have two. Mm -hmm. You know, that's hard. That's hard to deal with. So you mm -hmm. learn how to take one day at a time and mm -hmm. you learn how to move gradually at your own pace because mm -hmm. nobody grieves alike. Um, everybody is not on the spiritual level. I want to mm -hmm. encourage. I want to encourage you to do so, um, but you just have to take that one day at a time. And you mm -hmm. can't push yourself, but you help yourself, and you learn to live without that person because yeah. it's truly a process that you will never stop learning how to do. Right. Wow. Wow. So, um, so how long? I mean, I know you're saying like right after she passed, you were you kind of. Um, immediately kind of went to God and started praising him. You know, it seems like it was even out of instinct because that's what you had already been doing and you really, really needed God at that time. And so that's how you, how you um, responded. But what about the hurt? Like, do you, I know you said like you have to deal with it, but when did it become a little easier? Like, you know, cause I know the initial one, the initial reality that she was gone was very, very difficult and required some kind of adjustment there. But would you say you ever got to a place where it became um, more manageable? I'm not sure if that's the right question, but you know, you can try to answer it. If you want me to explain a little bit more, I can, but I'm just wondering if, when did it get a, to be a place to you that you were able to deal with her loss a little bit better? You never get to that point. The hurt is always there. I mean, okay. I'm still hurt from it right now. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm still hurt. I'm still torp about it. Mm -hmm. But I can't allow my hurt and my anger to get in front of my mission that mm -hmm. I have to fulfill. So okay. I have to keep it in check and I have to keep it at bay. Um, sometimes I get to feel it myself. Um, and then, you know, sometimes I just call it for what it is. But mm -hmm. who would you say that's right? Because mm -hmm. when you have a plan for your life that's designed, nothing, everything that's my whole life's been my whole life had been laid out from the time I was born. Mm -hmm. So I just have to follow the plan and try to make the right directions. I can't let my hurt and my anger consume me. Mm -hmm. And again, that's why I feel like I have an advantage over most mm -hmm. because I do have a mom. I did lose my dad in December, but I had a dad. Um, I have a husband. I have an older daughter that's 24. So I'm fortunate enough to have people mm -hmm. in my life to where I can be able to vent out some. I have a best friend. Um, I have Miss Lori. I have Tawanda Graves. So the Lord has really surrounded me with people who would just let me vent and be who I need to be when mm -hmm. I need to be there. Mm -hmm. But I try not to even do that with all of them because mm -hmm. at the end, I really have to give it all to him. Mm -hmm. So the hurt is still there. The hurt is never mm -hmm. going to go away. I'm going to miss okay. her until I, I walk through the gates and see her. Exactly. I'm always going to be confused and upset about some issues because mm -hmm. some of this just ain't right. Mm -hmm. And you know, slap in my face too, you know, because I have to really, really be humbled enough mm -hmm. 
to just try to work past the hurt and still wow. this path that's laid out for me. I have no control over what happens. He didn't ask my opinion about it. He didn't say, hey, do you mind if Amaya dies today? He didn't right. ask that he did it because he's God and he can do whatever he want to do. My job is to trust him and to keep myself together and carry myself in such a way to where he'll be magnified. Mm. So when you talk about, you say you you don't you want you don't want to allow your hurt and your grief to kind of distract you from your mission. What is your mission, and do you think that it's important for somebody who is grieving and going through something like this to have a mission? Like it helps. My mission is to help as many people who has been unjustified to help people that has felt like they were nothing. My mission is to put a smile on your face and to give you so some sign of hope after I leave you. That's my mission. My mm -hmm. mission is to tell you that you can make it no matter what you're going through and to tell you that there's a better way to go through whatever you're going through. That's my mission. My mm -hmm. mission is, is to tell people that there is really strength if you call on God, but you got to lean on him. That's my mission is to help mm -hmm. people. My mm. mission is to be that smile that you didn't think you could smile um, mm. because I've been down so low that, you know, I've been lower than most, but most have been lower than me. Um, so my job is just to give out some of this Jesus juice and keep it moving. <laughs> Jesus juice. <laughs> <laughs> so, so like, do you think having a clear understanding of your mission has kind of helped push you forward also? Like, do you think that's important? Like, you know, the Bible talks about without the vision, the people perish. So can you see somebody in your situation who don't doesn't have a vision, then be more becoming more easily consumed with their hurt and their pain and things like that? Yes, yes. Um, I know people that have went through what I've went through, and they are so consumed by it. it's it's so sad. And you want to get in there with them and you want to maybe console them but if you're not careful you'll become like joke friends mm -hmm. you know you'll kind of become like them so in those kind of settings i just try to speak the positive because okay. i do know people that have been impacted who are going through a whole lot who don't understand why who breaks down um and stuff and i and i just don't um, mm -hmm. but again, it's not to say how they're dealing with it is wrong because mm -hmm. again, no two people grieve alike. Um, I just happen to know somebody. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's just, you just try to help them, but you try not to get too involved with it. You mm -hmm. try to bring, I try to be the light in the room. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And I try to understand that we're all people and we're all human and a spare of the moment death something like that, something like some of these people have to go through. Mm -hmm. Their husband went to the grocery store and they're shot 50 times mm -hmm. and they they'll be right back. Mm -hmm. Or their child is just out doing something and somebody runs over them. Or their mm -hmm. husband is walking home from work and a car hit them. And then they turn around and they lose a child two years later. You get mm -hmm. an opinion? That's traumatic. Yes. Traumatic. Yes. yes. And you cannot teach Jesus to that person in two days. That person ain't trying to hear that. Because right. at that point in their life, they feel like he's the problem because he could have stopped it. Exactly. So you kind of have to pick your battles and you kind of got to know your environment. And then the word tells us to know those who labor among them. So I can't put all this Jesus juice on everybody. Everybody's <laughs> not accepting it. But what I can do is love you and hold you and just let you be who you are for a second. Because right. sometimes that's what we need is somebody mm -hmm. to hold us up and just let us be us. It's not always going to be a scripture. It's not always going to be a prayer. Um, mm -hmm. and that's one thing that I made very clear to people. I don't need a thousand prayers. I'm pretty mm -hmm. sure I'm connected. But <laughs> if you just come here and just be yourself. If y'all want to go out there and play football in the yard, go out there and play football in the yard. Mm -hmm. I know some of y'all drinking that yak in y'all cups. <laughs> go out there and drink the yaks in your cup. You get what I'm saying? I might mm -hmm. ask you to bring me a small sip. You just don't <laughs> ever know. You get what I'm saying? But I just want people to be who they are, especially mm -hmm. when they're grieving, because nobody can tell you who to be. 
Right. Wow. I, I, I'm just like, wow. I, I mean, for you to be so concerned about other people in the midst of, and, 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 you know, just comforting other people and trying to reach other people, like you were saying, even at your daughter's funeral, like it's mind boggling to me. Like, seriously, it's like, oh my goodness. I, I've learned a lot about leaning on God and understanding his strength and his peace through, through my own trials and chaos, but I'm pretty sure none of them compared to losing a child. But and so I understand what you're talking about in reference to the things that I've been through. But when I think about what it must feel like to lose a child and then to still see you able to just hold on to God really through all of it. I mean, it's, it's, it's very, very touching and it's very, very inspiring. And I would definitely say it's your mission because why I don't think the average person, even a, the average Christian, I don't think would, would be able to do that, honestly, you know? So I've heard about people losing, you know, that's Christians and losing their loved ones and things like that. And, and they really, really struggle very hard with it and, and end up blaming God and, and things like that, even if they have. So I don't I think what you're doing is, is, is very special. And I'm convinced that it's your mission because of how you're doing it. So. Uh, so, wow. Um, and so um one of the things that we talked about before um you mentioned before was that people in the church being some of your biggest opposers to you like seeking justice for your daughter and then you said something about um you know well first tell me like what what were some of the things that they were saying and to to in opposition of that so <laughs> In churches, I have learned, I've been to quite a few, that one thing that I I kind of regret, I regret is I will say that I see sometime in churches is we always put up that let me pray about it mentality or you kind of push people back a little bit because you don't want to deal with issues. Mm -hmm. So my former pastor um, was helping, like he drove the bus four hours to take them to the Capitol just so they can march versus maybe so much the church I was going to maybe didn't. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think anybody from that congregation showed up. Mm -hmm. So for whatever reason, I'm past it now, you know what I'm saying? But you know, that stuff kind of hurt. But, yeah, then, yeah. but again, I had to realize listening to that same preacher, my help, it never comes from man. Mm -hmm. You know, like, they were just not designed to be a part of it. So right. I let it go and continue to worship there, you mm. know, because I'm still moving and God mm. is still moving the people and he's still moving me now without any of that, without mm. any of them, because none of them is in Georgia with me. Right. Um, I was able to go back to the fellowship um, about two or three weeks ago, had a bomb time. I loved it. The word was good. The atmosphere was good. Mm -hmm. So one thing that I learned was you cannot depend on people. You mm. really can't. And a lot of the older generations or older Christians sometimes have this mentality and it's very unfortunate. Just pray about it. Mm. Or it's in the Lord's hand. You mm. know, and I don't necessarily just agree with just pray about everything because everything is not a just pray about a situation. Right. Um, that's why maybe you're so stagnated um, and churches are not growing and people are not being fulfilled in the word because we're just praying about it. Right. Right. We're going out and we're not doing it, but we're going to sit there and we're going to pray that it's going to yeah. happen. You yeah. know, so I'm so glad that the Lord woke me up and he keeps me. I'm in a class all by myself. That's not too many people <laughs> like Andrea Braxton out there. And I'm so grateful because I am that diamond in the rough. And I've been told that by a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, just by being around me, I don't know what they get from me because when I come around people, I just show them love and I'm just me. You get what I'm saying? We can laugh, we can chill out, we can, I can go home. Um, mm -hmm. So people just say that I just have that surprising thing, I guess, or whatever. I thank God for it because I, I like when people feel good when they leave my presence. I don't want to be a negative spirit. So mm -hmm. I've always been myself. And so I had to realize that's the mentality of these people. It's not to say that they're wrong. Mm. It's not to say that they don't have faith. Mm. But I can't stay with them. Right. 
have to move on to something else. Mm. And I catch you in the middle, or I see you at the top, whichever mm. one comes first. You get what I'm saying? Right, right, right. I did have a lot of church people though that were saying, um, not only at that fellowship, but people just that said they were just Christians in general. Oh, well, maybe you should let this go. God will take care of it. Um, you're probably not gonna get justice. Accidents happen from my community, from believers. So mm -hmm. it's not even about people. You have to keep your eyes on God. You have to keep your eyes on God because people will throw you off and not even mm -hmm. knowing that they're throwing you off. Exactly, exactly. And so when you say to keep your eyes on God, do you feel like God is, aside from what other, other people are saying, let it go, do you feel like God is saying, no, don't let it go? Is that what you kind of hold on to? Um, at one point I was, okay, God, I'm done. Mm -hmm. I'm done. I'm, I'm not going to get justice for it. If this is what it is, God, if this is what I had to go through, I'm fine with it. I'm done. Mm -hmm. And so every time I get to that, I'm done. It's because for one, things probably not going my way. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? And I'm having mm -hmm. a hard time coping with some things. Mm -hmm. So once I sit still for maybe like a, a week or two, bam, here goes somebody else. Hey, I got this for you. This is what I found out. Mm -hmm. Or I need you to do an interview over here. Or I want you to do an interview over here. So he won't let me leave it alone. Okay. The thing about it is, is I have to stay on that path, though. And that's mm -hmm. sometimes my hardest struggle. It's not going too fast, but stay in his grasp because the way things are taking off in my life now, I never would have, when she died, I knew something was coming, but I never knew what, because I know he just probably not just going to do this to me for no reason. Mm -hmm. um, not with my personality, not how I give myself and not how I praise him so much. So I knew that this wasn't happening to me for absolutely nothing. I knew some good was going to come out of it just exactly. because of how I worship him. No. So it just... <laughs> I'm sorry, that was your can No, it's not. <laughs> and so and so um and so it's just how oh my god, he made me lose my train thought. Could you catch me up? My baby made me lose my train thought. No, up. you were saying that you know you like God because the way you praise him, like he he won't let you like let it go. Yes, yes. <laughs> so I knew I didn't set up all these praises all these years. Good top pair. Very dedicated to, you know, whatever I could be dedicated to. Hard mm -hmm. work in the streets, treating people nice, people walking all over me, but I'm not even retaliating like that. Is So I knew from October the 4th, something was going to happen. And I knew that he did it for my good because I really did believe the scripture. I really do believe that scripture. Everything works together for my good. So if mm -hmm. everything works together for my good, then... Mm -hmm that is just going to open it up. And I had to make myself, I had to make myself look at it like this. God let her go for you to live. Mm. And I told my husband that. I said, God took her so we can live. Mm. I said, I don't know what's all going to happen. Mm. I said, but if we stick together and do what's right, He's going to bless us so much just because we trusted him and we stood firm. Mm -hmm. So that's what it, that's really what I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, can't nobody else make me believe anything any different because I just see God literally open up some doors that I knew. Like sometimes I can just be thinking about stuff mm -hmm. and then I get a phone call or there it is. I don't even got to ask for it. Mm. So I really saw him making some key plays in my life. So if he's going to make the plays and if I really trust him, I just got to stay on the path. And mm. so sometimes that's what I really do struggle with is staying on uh, on the path. You mm. know, and so mm. I, I struggle with that. And that's okay. Yeah. Everybody struggle yeah. with it. But I know yeah. I got to stay on the path. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Wow. This is deep. <laughs> um so okay, now in your in in your book, you talked about because I really found it very interesting what you said that God let her go so you can live. Um, you talked about you know a lot of the trauma and things that you went through. It seems like God kind of healed you from a lot of that stuff during the process of your grief. Can you talk about that stuff a little bit and and in relation to you saying like 
you you basically God let her go so you can live and and living was a part of you dealing with some of those things that you hadn't dealt with. Mm-hmm. So one thing that I knew from the moment that it happened, and I think on our last meeting, I think Miss Lori, I think she pretty much has found it very well. None of that stuff mattered on October fourth. None mm-hmm. of that stuff mattered. Mm-hmm. Um, it just didn't matter. Like after these men, grown men attacked me. Mm-hmm. I go down to my grandmother's house. They playing cards with my folks under the tree. Like mm-hmm. it ain't even happened. I seen that so much. You get what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. I grew up in my mom's house for barbecues. These people that did the wow. same. So I saw that and then I was getting angry. I, and and oh, I was so mad. So I remember that one of them actually was burned to death. Somebody put gas on him and burned him to death. Oh wow! And I remember praying for that person, and I felt so bad for them. Hmm. So things had things was kind of in some areas just fading away because I was beginning to deal with some things slowly mm-hmm. because there were some other things, you know, relationship wise in the marriage that wasn't quite right. Mm-hmm. So I'm trying to get through this to push this out. If it makes sense, my life was, it was just chaotic all the time. I'm not going to lie with all these different emotions. Mm-hmm. They diagnosed me with bipolar. They told me I was the most severe. They tried mm-hmm. to put me on medicine, mm-hmm. but I didn't stay on the medicine. I was like, no, nah, ain't nothing wrong with me. You know, mm-hmm. I just gotta, you know, no, nah, I can't take this medicine. It's just gonna slow me down. Right. So I'm not saying that. So if, if anybody's on medicine because you need it, you take it. You gotta do what you gotta do to recover. But it's for me, it was not needed. Mm-hmm. And so when that happened on October the 4th, mm-hmm. that was by that was the worst thing that had ever happened to me. In my life, mm. that was the worst thing. Mm. None of that other stuff mattered. Mm. It didn't matter what my daddy had said about me at that mm. moment. It didn't matter how they talked about me at school. It didn't matter how people looked down on me because I smoked cigarettes. None of that stuff mattered. Nobody. It, it didn't matter that they were saying that I was fat. It didn't matter that some people said I didn't have no booty. You know what I'm saying? I ain't had <laughs> It didn't matter that my hair was nappy. It didn't matter that I was barely paying my rent. It didn't matter. You know, none of that stuff mattered wow. before. None of that mattered. I mm. was faced with the worst thing that a person, a mom would ever have to go through in their life. Mm. Mm. And then eight, and then five years later, more garbage threw on top of that. So none mm. of that stuff mattered. Mm. Wow. I it didn't matter anymore. Wow. wow. It just without nothing to think about because there's many people that has been touched. That's been right. Many people. There's mm-hmm. many people that's been neglected by their parents. Many. Mm-hmm. There are, unfortunately, there is a lot of people out there who have lost their children mm-hmm. unjustly. Many. Mm-hmm. I'm no better than them. Mm-hmm. And I have told several people, Amaya passing, I can never compare that to somebody that's been raped because that is their Amaya. Mm-hmm. That is their death. That's mm-hmm. the death of them because mm-hmm. some people don't recover. Mm-hmm. I still struggle with some some things I still struggle with. But mm-hmm. I have obligations to a husband mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying that I know spiritually. Mm-hmm. So my spiritual life overrides a lot of other things. This mm-hmm. incomplete and inconsistency that I was feeling, I don't feel that way no more. I'm the bomb. I'm a boss. <laughs> you know what, I'm what you mean? <laughs> you better ask <laughs> <laughs> you know, so that stuff doesn't matter. All of it fell away. It it just didn't matter anymore. Wow. 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 I'm kind of speechless. So it seems like her death put your life in in, in a totally different perspective for you. Like maybe you were still holding on to some things and still struggling with some things, but that just just put everything in perspective. Like, wow. I mean, I always say I haven't had to deal with people dying close to me very, very much. And so, um, you know, all my siblings are still alive. My parents are still alive and things like that. 
And so, but anytime someone dies, it, it really affects me, but I'm not sure how it affect me if I was closer to them, but it affects me even when I'm not closer to them. And I always say that death really, really puts life into perspective. And if people are, you know, I think birth puts life into perspective too. So I think birth and death really, it really gives you a glimpse into what's what's really important. And it sounds like you had a very, very profound, you know, awakening of that when your daughter passed. And wow. Wow. So anyway, um, and so you just said like all this emptiness and stuff that you felt before, you don't feel it anymore. So how how was it that your life being put into perspective kind of gave you confidence? Um, I'm trying to connect the two. So, you know, your, your daughter passed and then life gets put in very, very sharp perspective. So where did the confidence and stuff come from? Like you said, the emptiness was gone and all that. So what, what was that? So my confidence come from, um, I really don't necessarily just say I'm a confident person. I just mm -hmm. say that I move day by day. Um, I'm just who I am. Mm -hmm. um, and my personality just makes up for a lot of my flaws. I was blessed to have one of those personalities. Everybody don't have it. Everybody can't do it. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes, you know, I'm, I'm just me. I'm me mm -hmm. all the time and I don't try to be nobody else. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Sometimes it might get me in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> but for the most part, I'm me. I'm just me. I don't. I don't play to have this confidence. I don't play to be this. I just. I'm just me. I'm just a plain old person who just want to make it day to day. Who just want to be treated like everybody else. Who, ref but I refuse to not stand up for what's right, and I just refuse. And I'm just tired of it. And I got to do what I got to do. And I got to do my part. I have to do my part to make this world a better place. So you have to do your part. The next person got to do their part. So I'm just doing my part. I just want to put a smile on your face. I just want to give you something to think about. I want you to feel like you have hope because if you've never been in a box and you never felt like that you haven't had any hope, then you cannot identify what I'm talking about. Exactly. I've been to some places where I've literally felt like there is no hope for me. It is over. Mm -hmm. Go ahead and end it myself. Lord, mm -hmm. you don't have to worry about doing it. I know I need to be out of here. Mm -hmm. I have felt that day. I have been oh, there. Yeah. I've been that person. Mm -hmm. But I'm not that person anymore. Right. I can totally, totally relate, unfortunately, because, you know, like what you were saying, you know, we all have our struggles. And so, yes, you're, you know, a lot of the stuff that you experienced came from the loss of your daughter. But, you know, I've struggled with those same feelings for different reasons. And so you really, you really have to, wow. So anyway, I have so many things going through my head right now. So you, you talked about in your book, you said, oh, I want to say this really quickly. Cause like, again, I have so much stuff going through my head. It sounds to me like you became more comfortable in who you are. So you just became more comfortable in your own skin and, and who you were and things like that. That's what it kind of sounds like to me when you talk about, you know, just being yourself, because a lot of people don't really feel comfortable just being themselves because they feel inadequate. And then you talked about the emptiness and things like that. And so you would have a sense of inadequacy, even subconsciously, without really realizing that's that's what you're doing. But then it seems like at some point you just became very, very comfortable with you, who you are and not so much worried about your inadequacies anymore. You know that they don't um, determine your value as a person. That's what it sounds like. And to something else, too, that I started to do, too, I really start to seek the word even more. I okay. start listening to some of this other stuff that I was listening to, and I start dedicating mm -hmm. certain, some parts to word. And that's what mm -hmm. I do. I drive over an hour to work every day. So I made that be my sanctuary while mm -hmm. I'm in my car. So I literally had to get my mind to a different place. Mm -hmm. um, so and. You know, and in the book, it also talks about, you know, me and Mr. Brass, you know, relationship and how everything was going. It even gave me an opportunity to take so much focus off of him. And because I was kind of dependent on him to make me feel like I needed to be this person. Mm -hmm. And so I was waiting on him to do that. And mm -hmm. I was hoping 
myself back by waiting on him to make me feel how I needed to be. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I totally understand. Yeah. Right, like I'm not even addressing him with the issue. I'm just feeling this way like he's supposed to know. Mm. You know what I'm saying? So I took all this stuff with me. Like I'm in my house and don't nobody love me. I'm feeling like that. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And so I even had to get myself. I even had to get the word. And then I even had to start doing stuff by myself as far as what a woman needs to do, what a wife needs to do, what the word say. And then when I so much took my focus off of him and I started putting my focus on myself, not saying that I was out here, you know, doing anything, anything like that, but mm -hmm. I was getting certain comments and looks and stuff from people out here in this whole nother world that I never knew. Mm -hmm. And so that really let me know, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait, wait. <laughs> why are you so insecure? Mm. You have absolutely nothing to be insecure about. Mm. Why are you trying to really figure out what this dude doing over here who's probably not even doing anything and you have all these defenses up? And so part of the reason why I was so depressed is I was making myself so depressed. Mm. Mm. Trying to figure out what I need to do for I did, I didn't have to do that. I can just mm. be me. Mm. So as I learned just to be me and not mm. to be nobody else, but not just be me, but be the best me. Mm. And I learned to be the best me even in my house. I don't even stress about stuff and worry about stuff. And so it's more peace here because mm. for one, I made the effort to find out, God, what do you really need me to do? How can mm. How can you use me to fix this situation? Exactly. And so I started saying, Lord, use me to fix the situation. And you have to talk to him because I'm done with talking to him. That's <laughs> to say to him because I've tried to do everything. So, God, if you fix me, then it will work out and help mm -hmm. me to deal with me and quit trying to deal with what he got going on. Mm -hmm. And so. And then I even saw that in our life. I even saw that turn around when mm -hmm. I stopped trying to be God in the house. Exactly. Oh wow. Wow. So um I just did a show about this last week and I think you I seen you chime in yeah, for a bit. You said hi, yeah. So we were talking about um, you know, in the relationships, how we kind of depend look for our husbands to be our saviors in a sense, and how you know, as a Christian, we actually have to get away from that, that we're actually doing more damage to the relationship and being more part of the problem than we realize. Um, because we're we're so focused on him and what he's supposed to be doing for us that we're not paying attention to ourselves. I went through very similar things for different reasons. So I totally, totally understand what you're talking about. Wow. And so what I find very, very, well, what stands out to me is like when you're talking about, you know, you really basically grabbed a hold to God, probably tighter than you ever have in your entire life because of what happened. And God really used that time to go a little bit deeper with you and really help you to, you know, find yourself. And it, it just really shows you the power of the mind. And so like when you, it's, it's not about what is or what, what is not, it's about what you're focused on. So if you're focused on the negative and you focus on what you don't have and you focus on the lack, then that is the experience of life that you will have. But when you switch your perspective and, and remember the scripture talks about renew your mind, this is what is renewing your mind is to switch perspective. Now, when you switch perspective and you focus on God and you let him feed you and he will tell you who you are and he will tell you what your worth and value is instead of you getting off, trying to get all this stuff from other people, mm -hmm. all of a sudden your confidence is like, this is the, basically the answer to the question that I asked you before about where did the confidence come from is like now all of a sudden when you know who you are in christ you you just feel like you're untouchable <laughs> you know it's like you know <laughs> it's like oh my goodness i can't believe i was tripping about this and this and this and this and that and, and this is who i was the whole time so i totally 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 understand what you're talking about and it's really a blessing when you know god worked that way in your life and then you see him doing that in other people's lives too it's, it's just really amazing and it's really amazing. wow so um i did want to um ask you um about your marriage because you do talk about that in the book too i um, mean you you spoke about it briefly and i think you basically answered the question a little bit but i still just want to answer just ask the question in case something else comes to your mind that you might want to bring up because you really talk about you know how you know your marriage was but it's you talk about you guys still being together 
and the things that you learned during this process and things like that. And so do you, so how do you feel like the death of your daughter, um, how do you feel like it helped or damaged your marriage? Like what effect do you feel like it had on your marriage? Well, the good thing I can say is it didn't necessarily have any effect on us because we were working through issues before she even passed away. Okay. So if so, if tomorrow we decided that it was over with, it would have nothing to do with the passing of Amaya okay. because it, because we've been working on it for twenty years, for twenty plus years. Okay. So we had nothing to do with that. Okay. Um, so the only thing that I could truly say is. As a woman, I needed that soul support. And I literally felt like I just never got it. And I'm just being so honest. I, I mean, I wrote it, so I'm just being so honest. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just felt like, um, I just felt like, how can I answer this right? Because people ain't gonna believe me. I just don't worry about it. I just, it just, that just never affected. It just never, like all the solo work and stuff that I've done, I have realized that you cannot make people be who you are and you cannot make your spouse, male or female, work the way you want them to work and deal exactly. with your grief. You just cannot. Exactly. So you feel like that you got a calling and you feel like it's, it's work that needs to be done, then you have to be the one to do the work. And unfortunately, I'm the one that does the work right now. And if he jumps back in it and does the work with me, great. But if not, I'm still going to move because mm -hmm. it's more than enough. Mm -hmm. and, he, <laughs> me, and, and he blesses me and he opened doors for me that if he just do right and treat me right, then God's going to bless him mm -hmm. because he's a part of me. Mm. So who's to say who's going to bring the blessing to the house? I just don't necessarily believe that it's always the man that these at this time. I mm. feel like I have enough God in me and he loves me enough and I'm anointed enough that he could put the seeds in my hand and mm. I can come home. I do believe that, you know, I might be like 75% <laughs> preachers of the virtual, the virtuous woman. I'm like, percent. I need that like the other 25. I don't know where it's going to come from. Might not never get but mm -hmm. I do know that I go hard um, for my spouse. Um, I take care of him the best that I can. And I love him the very best that I can. And I mm -hmm. honor him the very best that I can because I'm required to by God. And so that's mm -hmm. like a lot of the things, too, that has actually kept me and Mr. Brasson together is because mm -hmm. I made a choice. I'm going to stay with him until I get ready. Mm. Because this is who I am, mm. and I told you know I told God I said God I, I'm I've been married already. By the time mm. I was 15, I had my first husband. I don't want a second, third. And <laughs> but I just don't believe that it take all that to each his own. Who does mm. all? That. So when I went into the marriage, regardless of what was through at me and how you know things was happening, I went in there to with I'm gonna serve you mm. until you have no choice but to do me right. Mm. I'm be nice to you because I'm the type you can treat me like a dog and I can still go in there and fix you a full cost meal and serve it to you because mm -hmm. I believe that there's power in being humble and sometimes mm. you got to go through things mm. and then too the Bible also tells us about Hosea and mm. that right this and I absolutely love that story because when I was listening to it the other morning I said that makes so much sense mm. and you know I do believe um, that husbands, I do believe that if a husband truly love his wife like church, like Christ did the church, that's nothing. There's no need that he can't meet for her. Mm -hmm. But the problem is everybody's not in line. And exactly. so our men don't necessarily line up all the time, but that's why we have to pray. And that's why we have to be humble. And that's why somebody has to stand still and say, mm -hmm. I'm not going to move. Mm -hmm. I'm going to stand on your word. Your word told me that if I love him and if I love God, and if I serve him, then you will straighten him up. And mm -hmm. for the man. Mm. Sanctify my, a sanctified man will save his house. A sanctified mm. woman can help save her husband. Mm -hmm. So you, 
have it both ways. That's what the words say. If the word is there for me, then no matter how bad things get sometimes that I got to humble. And then, you know, you say, I've heard some women say, well, he ain't going to do this and he ain't going to. That's out of order. It's it's all somebody got to get in line. That's exactly. Why, oh, my goodness. That's why houses. That's why schools. That's why church. Somebody got to get in line in the house. And so mm. I'm making a decision, a conscious decision. I'm going to be the one that's going to do my best to stay in line. Wow. Wow. I don't know if you know how powerful what you just said is. Oh, my goodness. Like so many. Mm. You know, in today in today's idea of relationships, people don't want to deal with anything. Like as soon as they're uncomfortable, they're not getting what they want or their needs are not met, they're ready to jump ship. And that is not how God works. You know, that's not how He, like you say, saves your household and reforms your family. And somebody has to be willing to be used in order for God to operate. And I think that is just that is so so powerful. And so many young women really need to understand that. That's how God operates in relationships and not just, you know, oh, he's not giving me this. I'm out of here or, you know, or having a bad attitude or whatever, whatever, Mm -hmm. because he can't he can't he can't work if you don't let him work through you. Or like you say, even if it's vice versa, because it's not always the wife. Sometimes it's the husband. I've seen it. But somebody has to be in line like, oh, my goodness, you're you're so, so right. Um, And so. um. I had a question and I just lost my train of thought because of what you said, but, um, but wow, that's, that's, that's oh, so That's what I was going to say. So one thing that I've realized in my own, um, you know, walk with God when it comes to relationships in that way is that, like you said, the husband, if he's in line, he can be that for you. God kind of designed him to, but if he's not, that doesn't mean now you're just without because the person that he's supposed to get it from, if he's in line, is God. And so if he's not being the vessel that God can transport that to you, God is still God. God does not disappear because the husband is not doing what he's supposed to do. Now you just have to go through the source and get it yourself. Mm-hmm. And when you go through the source and get it yourself, he he creates an overflow in you, you know, to where all these things that you feel like you needed your husband to do or he just has to do this for you. You don't really need, it's like, if he does it, great. And if he doesn't, I'm fine. So, so God really kind of heals you in a way to where, because you're not looking for this so desperately from your husband, you're able to, like you said, what do you want me to do? You're able to get direction from God more clearly about what you need to do to actually get to the, to take the steps Mm -hmm. to get to that marriage that he designed for all of us to have. And so, um, so, I mean, that overflow, I think, is so, so important because it helps you still be nice when your husband's being a jerk or still love him and fix his food when he's not acting right. So that's that's really so, 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 so important to, to understand, especially for women, because I feel so bad for women who are like chasing their husbands around for stuff. Like, you know, like you need him to tell you this. You need him to make you feel it's like, oh, poor, poor baby, because that's not. <laughs> that's not what he's in your life for. Like, you know, you know, if you can't get it from him, go get it from God. God is not holding it. He's not playing games with it. He's not going to tease you with it. You get it from him. And that's better than what you would get from your husband. So, so yeah. But anyway, um, and so um, one thing and, and two more questions, and then we can go ahead and wrap this up. You said in, something in your book that I think was very, very powerful, which is be careful what you ask God for. Can you explain that a little bit, like what you meant by that? So in general, in in general, we have to be careful what our mouth says. Mm-hmm. Sometimes we idolize people and we idolize their things and what they have. Mm-hmm. And then sometimes we be praying and we be asking God for more patience. Mm-hmm. We be asking God for more faith. He gives it to us, but he don't give us, he don't give it to us the way we think. It comes with a storm and it does come with strings attached. Mm, mm. Uh, blessings of uh, the fruits of the spirit comes with attachments. It mm. comes with strings. 
Um, mm-hmm. Because something got to work that nerve in order for you to find out about your patients. Exactly. So I prayed for a whole bunch of things. And one thing that I prayed for was pray. Uh, I, I paid for patience because mm-hmm. I had not really necessarily always been a patient person. That's how I ended up with a husband and a baby. By the time I was 15 years old, I could not wait to get out there and do that old foolish stuff. So, right. wow. Um, so something. So, yes, you do have to be careful what you pray for. You do have to be careful because God will answer you. Mm. Um, he don't also answers that polite stuff sometimes that we be asking for. Sometimes he'll answer some of that evil stuff that you ask, and he'll let it fall upon you to see, hey, you really didn't think that was cute. Now, now. you really didn't want that, now did you? You know. Exactly. Kind of like so I have been praying for a lot of stuff, and some things that he gives to me, I'm like, well, Lord, I'm I'm more patient now, but I didn't want it this way. I didn't want. Right. You know I didn't want to have. Like, I mean, I didn't want to have to lose a brand new car and a brand mm. new house. Mm. Um, mm-hmm. I prayed for children. It took me and my husband 10 years to have our first one together. Oh, and, I wow. prayed, and I prayed and I prayed and I went, I saw doctors and I prayed and I prayed and I prayed. And so as soon as we had our first child together, I was taken off, I was, I was taken off my job. I lost mm-hmm. the house. We had just got our, our car, lost it all in a whole year and had to start right back over in the trailer park. Wow. But I'm patient. And I know. <laughs> and I know how when somebody tell me no, I pretty much know how to either wait on it or I'll just work around it and go into something else and come back to it. Exactly. You know what I'm so, yeah. So you have to be um, careful um, on what you ask God for. Mm. Um, it's best just to say his will. And I learned that. Like, have you ever heard <laughs> of a woman say, oh, well, I'm, I'm praying for a husband, but I'm going to be specific with God. I want him to be like this and I want him to be like that. So then she finds this guy that's pretty much what she said, but she sure did leave out a man after God's own heart. She mm-hmm. leave that out though, don't she? Mm-hmm. But now he got the muscles and all his teeth and the money and the nice car. Mm-hmm. It might even be good in bed. Mm-hmm. Indeed. Mm-hmm. But what about that tree you mean when he slapped you across your face? Exactly. When oh. he got home for two weeks. You know, that's the kind of stuff. So, yeah, you got to be careful because, oh, yeah, he answers prayer. I, <laughs> I used to stay in church all the time. If you call on Jesus, he'll answer prayer. Yeah, he'll answer prayers. But mm. you better be praying the right prayer. And that's exactly. one thing that I've learned now is to ask for the right thing. Mm. Ask the right question. Mm. Wow, that's powerful, too. And, like, even with me, I used to say when I was younger and I would pray and I would say, Every time I pray, stuff get worse, <laughs> you know. Um, and I used to like, you know, not understand like why. But the thing is that he is not concerned with making you happy on the outside and just giving you what you want. He will use what you want to build character in you. Mm-hmm. And so it's not like you know he just will give you this bad stuff and say, "Ha ha, you shouldn't pray for that." He's like, "Okay, since this is what you want, then I'm going to use this." to get to you the results that I want, which is for you to be more patient, more kind, more long suffering, more, more prayerful, not so selfish, you know? And so he uses those things to, to build character in us. But yes, I totally agree. Um, yeah, you, you definitely have to um, be careful what you ask God for, because it usually don't come in the way that you expect. And, and most of the time, you know, we don't want to go through anything and, and he's not, he's not going to be like, Oh, well, I'll give you patience, but I don't want to push you too much. No, he'll push you <laughs> to, to show you exactly what patience really means. Mm-hmm. Um, so, wow, this was, we're like 10 minutes over now. I feel like we could have so many deep conversations about this. And I, I don't think this will be the last interview we have. Um, I, I want to do regular segments about relationships. And I think, you know, especially from your perspective and experience, you can really add, you know, a lot to that conversation. So I'll reach out to you next time I get ready to do something like that to see if you you're interested in that. Um, do you talk? I mean, I know you talk about, you know, the injustice that happens happens with your daughter, and you um, you talk about your relationship with God and how things change for you in the process of everything. And you know, you say you're trying to put a smile on people's face and your mission. Do you talk about marriage? Because I mean, I feel like what you're saying, a lot of young women need to know. Do you ever do any, um, um, you know, speak of speaking about marriage and things like that anywhere? Okay, so let me tell you. 
People don't necessarily <laughs> like my taste on marriage because okay. it's just I'm real about it and I try to line it up with the scripture saying because I've been told for a long time people to just know me and him. I ain't no way I'll do this. You know, mm-hmm. ain't no way you won't, but you ain't got. <laughs> Maybe that's why you want because you can't. You get what right. I'm saying? So, you know, so you'll deal with that a lot, but people don't want the truth. Mm-hmm. And it goes both ways. Women don't want the truth, but men don't want the truth either. Somebody mm-hmm. got to stand up. Mm. And do what's right mm. because we're losing our generation, we're losing our legacy because mm. everybody's out of place. I would love to actually talk about marriage and relationships because there's just so much misinformation. Mm. And it's bad to say, but sometimes this comes from the wrong setting. Mm. I, I think I would like to see more marriage counseling and marriage stuff in the house of God. I would really love for them to bring that back because. Mm. When I went to Good Shepherd, he actually taught the men how to come to their wives. He mm-hmm. actually taught us how to be an intimate couple. And he mm-hmm. also taught, I know how to be holy in the bedroom with my husband, but still be a freak too. I know how to do all that. Mm-hmm. I know how I'm supposed to come clean, nice, a ladylike. Mm-hmm. He knows how to come to bed smelling good. That's the stuff that matters. Okay, mm-hmm. now you got these people. Give me the ten percent. Give me the offering. And Jimmy coming home, then been up on the house all day. Ain't took nobody bath. Ain't shaved. Ain't did nothing. It's confusing. She dirty. She. I mean, so <laughs> you know, the, the family back together. I mean, so yeah, I'm totally in for that. And also, I just want to say this: God works on Tuesdays too. Is available on Amazon. However, mm-hmm. I am the subject, but Miss Lori L. Story is the one who created this lovely masterpiece. So yeah. who goes to her? I just want to make sure I let everybody know that Miss Lori Story is the author of the book. She is the one who had to take my little thoughts because I have them, and she had to turn a beautiful creation out of it. So I just want to make sure that I give her her props for that. Yeah, thank you so much. I was going to ask you that to make sure you tell people where they can get the book and things like that. So yeah, it's a very good read, very real story, very open story. Mm-hmm. Uh, it definitely gives you a peek inside of like what women go through, especially mentally and emotionally and things like that. So I would definitely suggest it, uh, you know, any young woman or older woman or woman in general, that it's definitely a book to read, even outside of like the, your, you know, of course it's, ba- it's based around what happened to your daughter, but it's, it's more than that. It talks about basically being a woman also. Mm-hmm. And so I, I think it is, people should read that. Um, so before we, you know, head off for tonight, if what would you want to say to any mother that is, you know, grieving right now because they lost a child? Like, what would you want to say to them? You cannot afford to lay down and die because that is exactly what the enemy wants you to do. That is exactly what life wants you to do. Mm-hmm. You just have to keep on moving and you just learn not to set the extra table. You just learn not to set the extra plate. You just have to learn that, but you have to do it at your time. But you have to be determined to keep on living and make this be your testimony. Make this be where your source, your source of strength come from. Let this be your driving force because there's somebody else that's going to be sitting in your seat in just a few days and you want to be able to leave them out. Mm, Wow. Wow. That's good. All right. So thank you so much, Andrea. I'm glad we had this conversation. It was just as enlightening and powerful as I expected it to be. (laughs) Um, And I just really thank you for doing this. And I pray that God uses this broadcast to bless anybody who might need to hear some of the things that we talked about. So Thank you again. And you guys remember to pick up her book. It is on Amazon. It's called God Works on Tuesdays too. And is is there anything you else you want to add, especially for Amaya and you know, any petitions or anything you have going on in that in that area? Yes, so the petition is still going and it's just as for Maya. We are trying to get to a million signatures. We are almost there. So y'all make sure that you guys subscribe. Also, if you guys will leave a Google review on God Works on Tuesdays too, y'all go on Amazon. We need those reviews. We need those likes. And it's still on sale. She has not changed it yet. Miss Lloyd has not changed it yet. So you can get your copy. I think for five ninety nine. dollars mm-hmm. it- will not be a total waste of time. I promise you, you're going to laugh, you're going to cry, but you're going to find yourself in there. And hopefully you'll leave with a smile because if I overcame, so can you.
Oh, good. Amen. Amen. And that's a perfect place to end it. So good night, you guys, and I'll see you next week. Bye.